our business this year went up by over a hundred percent. And we started making a lot of money. It, it, it's, it's hard for anybody who's uh, not doing what I'm doing to understand what this means. But we have a business that makes 80% gross profit percentage. So that's quite extraordinary in the apparel business. My guest today is George Zimmer. George was the founder of the men's warehouse clothing chain and CEO, board chair, and television spokesman for the company for 41 years. Under George's leadership, the men's warehouse became the largest men's specialty chain in history with his famous slogan, you're going to like the way you look, I guarantee it. His latest book, I Guarantee It, the untold story behind the founder of Men's Warehouse, recounts the journey of Zimmer's rise and the fall of Men's Warehouse and his personal renewal. I recently sat down with George and we talked about how he built Men's Warehouse from scratch and his stunning firing from his hand-picked board of directors. George, I want to thank you for being on the show. I greatly appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this since we spoke and since uh, you sent me your book. Uh, the name of the book, folk, folks, is uh, the unto I guarantee it, The Untold Story Behind the Founder of Men's Warehouse by George Zimmer. George, welcome. Well, thank you, Charles. It's a pleasure. All right. That voice doesn't change. Huh? Just is, it just keeps, keeps getting better, like fine wine, huh? Well, from your lips to <laughs> God's ears, I... <laughs> All right. George, I want to tell you, you know, back in the day, um, when I was a kid, there weren't that many places to shop for men's clothing. And I was a big kid. So uh, I think I quickly outgrew the Husky department in Alexander's. So my mother would go to uh, there were the local mom and pop men's stores, which had two and a half suits, uh, and one happened to be green in my size. And it was just a terrible, terrible, terrible experience. So I, I want to get into how you started Men's Warehouse, how you built up a beautiful, beautiful chain, because you had a store that I used to go to on uh, 46th and Mad, Madison. Correct. Beautiful. Be it was really a nice Number store. Number one store. Number one, huh? Out of 1,200, that was the top store. I think you had more people per square inch that needed suits <laughs> than anywhere in the world. <laughs> That's right. Oh, you know, you walked into that store, and the sense you got was, nah, these pants are only $70. Something's wrong. You, you know, you expected just the way you designed the store uh, to go in there and spend $200 on a pair of pants. And here were pants. And you had your, your tailors alter it for you. And we had your size. And you had my size. Yeah, you had more than one pair of pants. That was great. All right, George, before we get into that, I read your book. And uh, fascinating how uh, a guy like you started a business after being uh, just just disrespected or really pissed on by a, a buyer at a department store. And you said, I'm going to start a business and a whole bunch of reasons. You started with nothing. But before we do that, before we do that, the garment business runs through your veins. Talk to me about that. Well, as I'm sure, you know, uh, uh, there's always been anti-Semitism in the United States. And uh, up until uh, my generation, uh, Jewish people were relegated to either the clothing or the jewelry business. And my family happened to be in the clothing business. My father worked for Robert Hall Clothes, which was uh, kind of the original uh, pipe rack discounter uh, based in New York City. And uh, I guess there was some osmosis at work because when I was a, a young boy, uh, single digits in age, I would run around Robert Hall stores on Saturdays with my dad, uh, uh, raising havoc uh, and making no positive contribution, but entertaining myself until we could go out for lunch. 
And, and what what about the business that you love? Because it's you know it's like uh, the, the garment business is such a tough business. Men's wear not as tough as like a ladies wear business, right? It's not as it's not the fashion doesn't change as much. Maybe a men's lapel would move a quarter of an inch here or there or the ties, but in in the ladies business you can't sell you can't sell last year's goods and your inventory is kind of dead right after the season. So what was it about the garment business that just got into your blood? You said, I really like this business. Well, you know, when I started men's warehouse, I was 24. I had next to no money. Uh, So it wasn't really uh, that uh, I made a, a, a scan of all the opportunities in the world and and decided on opening up the men's warehouse. Uh, It was really all I knew and uh, all my father knew. And I relied on my father when I opened the first store, not only for uh, credit, but for product, which I put in my stores. So you had the idea at 24 and you uh, found the storefront, uh, nothing fancy, right? Just, what'd you call it, pipes? Um, plain pipes, yeah, very, very plain. Okay. Uh, uh, tile floor, uh, exposed ceiling. I mean, it was really plain. And uh, all the money I had, which was not insignificant, it was $7,000, went to first and last month's rent, 3,500 a month. And, you oh, know, wait, when wait, we, hang on, George, in 19, what, what year was it? 1950 something? 73. No, when you opened your first store, you were in 1973? Yes. So $3,500 a month, that's a big rent. Well, it was a big store. It was 6,000 square feet. Yeah, but that's a lot. You know, what were you selling your suits for? Uh, we didn't carry suits. We just sold sport coats and slacks. So what was the average ticket? What was the average uh, uh, receipt? 50 bucks. How much? 50 bucks. Five zero. That's all. You, boy, you had a lot of faith, man. I, I don't Looking back, and I don't want to even adjust it, uh, $3,500 a, a month rent. How long was the lease? Uh, four months with a five-year option. Okay. So you know in four months, you, you were on the hook for $28,000. No, what am I talking about? $14,000. Yeah. Okay. But still, you know, looking back, that that that's a pretty big leap. You know, it sounds small in today's dollars, but I'm just thinking, that's a lot of orders. That's a lot of goods you got to move. Well, let me say, uh, so you don't think of me as some... Uh, 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 hero, uh, really what, what, what you do when you're 24 and you have the audacity to start a business, uh, it, there's got to be more to it than the opportunity to make money. That really is a, a, a modern day idea that emerged, uh, with Ronald Reagan and, and beyond, Uh, In 1973, the main reason I opened the men's warehouse was that I wanted to be the master of my own life. I decided I did not want my life to depend on the whims of other people. And I wanted to be able to uh, uh, sink or swim on my own merits. That was the reason I opened yeah. the first store. And it never actually changed. It never became about money, even though the money became substantial uh, when you're the top dog in a, in a company that uh, grows to 1,200 locations. The, the top guy does well, but it was never about money. Right. It was, it was your, your own freedom. You wanted to be your own boss. You don't want anyone telling you when to come in, when to leave, when you could take vacations. And you know what the funny thing at the end of the day is you're working 90 hours a week. So you think people think you start your own business. It's easy street. You're working more than you're working for less than minimum wage. 
Well, that's true. And that's why I've often said that I don't understand how married people can do it. Because if you're married, uh, you have uh, family responsibilities and it just is, is awkward to have to work the uh, uh, hours that you work to build a company. And, you know, it, you don't have to work so hard, but you don't have to have such, such a successful business. I mean, there's a correlation there. Yeah, no, you're spot on because I started my own money management firm. I can't believe it was 22 years old. No contacts, no anything, just real gumption. And we rented a small little office, 400 square feet for $800 a month on 8th Avenue. And 8th Avenue with 38th Street was not a nice place back in the day. It was pretty raunchy near the Port Authority. I know where it is. Yeah, it was, ooh, <laughs> back in the day it was terrible. And I did start it about a year before I got married. And, uh, you know, it, 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 and, and when you find a spouse who believes in your dream, that's 95% of it because uh, you're right. You, you, the business takes over. It's, it's an entity in and of itself, and you devote a lot of time and thought to it. And I, I figured that was the best time of my life to start a business. So, you know, worse comes to worse. I was still living in my parents' house, so what's the big difference? I still sleep in the same bed, and I still got a roof over my head, and I got dinner on the table. Mom prepared it. So... What was the worst that could happen? I, I, expand, I, I my, my credit line and my, 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 my credit card is depleted. I'll make money somewhere else. <laughs> you know? Exactly. I never worried about things uh, until, uh, you know, I started in Houston and I wrote about it in the book. Uh, you know, there was a uh, uh, first people were waiting in line to get gasoline. I don't think you remember. Oh no, that, no, I, I definitely remember seventy three, seventy four. The gas, the uh, the Arab boycott. Yeah, it was terrible, bizarre. Right, you'd wait an hour to get five gallons of gas, and it it was a, a strange world. And then in Houston, it were in the state of Texas, uh, things collapsed, and all the banks. I mean, a hundred percent of the banks in Texas were taken over by New York banks because everything in Texas went south. Oil, yeah, that oil, the oil was just terrible. I remember reading, uh, this was a little later on when the oil crisis happened during, I think it was 77 with the, uh, 78 or so with the Shah of Iran and then 79. Remember when they had yeah. that and the prices went through the roof? I remember reading in yeah. the journal at the time that yeah, I was a kid reading the journal. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Figure out the age I was. I was a kid reading the journal. I should tell you something about how involved I was in business. And I remember you had people who had mansions, and they were still living there, but they couldn't afford to heat them, so they would huddle in a small room, and uh, they didn't have enough electricity because they couldn't pay for it. But they had these ten thousand square foot houses they couldn't afford. Yeah, no, it. it I mean, most people. I mean, you know, the bank I had called my loan and they called it. I wrote about this in the book uh, because I had guaranteed uh, a debt uh, for my father of one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. And my father in his own business filed Chapter 11. I called the guy who I had co-signed this note and I I told him about it. And he picked me up at uh, Teterboro in New Jersey in a uh, Cessna that he flew down from New Bedford, Mass. And it was so funny. I go up to New Bedford with my father and a guy named Dominic Nicolacci, who obviously was part of the mob and was the silent partner in this uh, large apparel business, uh, put his arm around my shoulder, took me outside and said, uh, you're doing the right thing, George. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember thinking I must be in a movie. <laughs> but if it, you know, I remember back in the day when we, I was in my father's garment business for a very short span of time. And that taught me to get out of that, the, the, the schmata business. And get in finance. I remember all the contractors uh, 
in New York were all uh, had some mafia relation and union shops, and uh, um, the the uh, carting companies were all mafia and the um, the trucking companies to move goods. So everything you were dealing with the mob back. And my mom was big into the apparel business. When my dad got fired in 1960 from Robert Hall, and he went into his own business, and he told me that to bring a, a truck from a factory in Connecticut into Manhattan to his office with samples, there was nothing but samples that he had to work with the mob. You could not bring any truck into Manhattan without a deal with the mob. And if you thought you're going to do it and they wouldn't notice, they would cut your tires or otherwise screw with your truck. Yeah, no, I want to tell you what what happened was, and it was 1980 or 81, 81, 81, and I used a contractor down in, um, down in Chinatown. And um, I didn't truck it over there by a uh, union truck. And uh, I had a van, you know, we're trying to save money as best we could. And I drove, sure. rented a van. I put the hundred dozen piece goods gone there. Uh, <laughs> next day I get one of these, but it wasn't Dominic. It was a guy that must've looked like Dominic because he came over, he goes, we don't do that. Next time you have to move goods, you move me. And they had a car parked in front of our shop for about a week, just sat there 10 hours a day. I was intimidated the hell out of us. And needless to say, never again <laughs> were goods ever transported by me and my van. <laughs> That's right. No, it, uh, and unless you grew up in New York, you don't really understand right. Right. what we just talked about because I don't think in any other city is it that way. I mean, I'm not aware of it. No. no and also, also the, the carting business, your garbage. Uh, a guy came by and said, you're using us. There was no comparison or cause for this was it, and this was the price. But there was no but. <laughs> that was it. You either pay me or you don't pay me. It's, it's, it wasn't a you know, real a choice. Cute, a cute story. Uh, you probably remember the uh, garbage strike in New York City, right, where the garbage was stacking up on the streets. And uh, so here's the story. A guy comes up with a clever idea, and he gift wraps his garbage and puts it in his car leaving it unlocked, and sure enough, it's stolen. That's a, uh, yeah, it was terrible. Back in, the, back in the 70s, it was terrible. So when you opened your store, how soon after did you know you had a hit? Well, I would say by the mid-80s, when I finally came up with the economic model that we used uh, from then on, I, I realized that this would work literally any place in America. And uh, it, 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 it made me go. What, what was it? So, so, okay, so in 73, you open your first store, you're paying $3,500 a month rent. You realize you got a good, oh, by the way, I, I totally forgot the most important thing. You're doing your own advertising. You're, you're, you're the face uh, of uh, the commercial. No, I didn't start that to the mid 80s. Oh, that was much later. Was oh. the, so wait, this picture yeah. in the book is you in the 80s? When you're doing your own advertising? I guess. I must yeah, have that, that. that's me in the, uh, no, no, the, yeah, in the, on the front of the book where I'm in a tuxedo. No, 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 you have a picture here. I guess um, um, in the back of the book, you have a whole bunch of nice pictures of your family. Yeah. Right. Well, you know. there's a caption for each one, so you. Oh, can here it is, right? Know. It's the mid '80s, right? I, I didn't goof around in our early commercials like this one from the mid '80s. George Zimmer, president at the Men's Warehouse. It must have been a nicer store because you have ceiling tiles. That must have been back in the yes. day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, we still had that in the mid '80s. Okay. <laughs> so, so you opened your store in '73. They, they say the hardest store is your first store, and then after that, it becomes a bit easier because you, your first is your biggest risk, right? You don't know if the marketplace is going to like it, if your pricing's right, if your location's right. So all those kind of, you know, they kind of melt away. They're always there, and you always have to be on your game. I don't have to tell you that. But when do you know that that first store, that, that first Houston store, when do you know that, I think we got it, I think we had something different? Because you're not the first guy to sell men's sport jackets and pants, right? So what is the magic? Well, here, here's, here's what happened. Uh, we opened in uh, 
the summer of 73 and in the spring of 75, I met a man who became like my uh, older brother. Uh, he's passed away now. And he said to me, uh, we met at a wedding in Chicago. And he said to me, uh, well, you ought to go on TV, George. Now, this was uh, April of 75. And I said, well, I really can't afford it. And he said, well, if you give me your entire annual budget, whatever that is, I will put it on TV for a couple of months. And after about three weeks, your business will start to take off. So I thought, well, that sounds reasonable. And sure enough, he comes down to Houston and looks at our inventory in March mm -hmm. and says, you don't have enough inventory to go on TV. And I remember going, Whoa. are you kidding me? <laughs> and I got more inventory. It took uh, about a month. We went on TV and like he said, in about three weeks, our business started going up and, and, and it went that way for uh, almost 50 years. Isn't that amazing that one chance encounter with a guy in Chicago uh, gives you, it's just, you never know where opportunity is going to find you. Right. It, uh, and when I first started working with this guy before he became uh, successful, uh, we met in Queens and his office was above a deli next to the L. And I mean, it was, you can imagine this and maybe some of your listeners, but it, you know, it was just unbelievable. We'd go down and have the deli bring up lunch every when, when we worked there. It was, uh, it was so typical Queens for that era. Amazing. So you took so so you differentiated yourself. I don't, what was the landscape like uh, for menswear stores back when you were doing this? Because I recall you had Robert Hall, but they went out of business. We had in New York yeah. uh, Field Brothers. Remember Field Brothers? Sure, okay. but the the model was Lomans. You remember Lomans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well Lomans was doing uh, in women's wear what I tried to do in men's. That that was the model. Right, so that was now the, it, the Mo Ginsburg model and the Fifth Avenue in 20s where everyone just had a loft. They bought goods, they put them up there, and they had someone in the street hand out papers. That was, that, that's where I, I remember, uh, you know, where you got your suits from. Yeah, well, I you know, because of what you said earlier, you know, I took a store in a, in a shopping center for 3,500 a month. It was very different than what Mo Ginsburg did, you know, upstairs. I used to move tremendous amounts of suits. It was just, uh, you know, they, uh, I just remember people walking out with two or three suits. The prices were low. Uh, I know your prices were the same way. Yeah, no, we did uh, uh, a lot more units than our volume reflected. That was true, actually, the entire time I was there, we always did more units. In fact, uh, at the end of my uh, career at Men's Warehouse, uh, one out of five suits in the United States were purchased at Men's Warehouse. That's amazing. Very, yeah, that's it, just absolutely uh, amazing. Right. It. I mean, hey, that's 20%. That's not you know, what Apple or, or people like that have. But in the men's business, the highest number before Men's Warehouse was uh, J.C. Penney at 10%. And what was your magic? What, why were you able, I'm not talking at the height, but in the beginning stages, because when you start to build up momentum, everything just starts to click in because you had some history. You're, uh, you know, as you're reading the book, you're a very smart guy in terms of, picking the people to be around. You happen to find a lot of good people to help you along the way. 
Uh, you were very astute. You knew the marketplace. In those first early days, what was that flywheel that just made everything go? What was your what was your model? Selling sport jackets and 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 pants. Was it the markup? Was it the store? Was it the low overhead? What was your what was your secret? You know, now this is a bit immodest, but I'm trying to answer uh, honestly. And I really think it was uh, the authenticity that I had about everything I did, because for the first uh, eight years, we were just a Houston based company. And uh, I led the store manager meetings and visited the stores every week, worked every Saturday in one of the stores. And people came to know that the men's warehouse was a, a different type of business. Yes, we were a for-profit business where we celebrated capitalism but we were more than a traditional capitalistic business. Uh, in fact, I wrote about this in the book that uh, we, we called it stakeholder capitalism, meaning that it's not just about maximizing shareholder value, which is what Adam Smith wrote about in The Wealth of Nations, that it's about maximizing all the stakeholders the employees, the customers, the communities, uh, and yes, the shareholders. Right. But they they have to be in balance, and it's to be honest, I, I don't see much support for this idea, even after all these years. Okay, so you have the store, the store is doing well, you open up store number two, and it starts to catch on. So now, talk to me now at the early, the early 1980s, how many stores do you have at that point? Well, in 81, we jumped from Houston to the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, as I sometimes uh, uh, jokingly say, uh, that may have saved our business lives because of the collapse in Texas that I referred to earlier. So how many stores do you have at that time in 81? We had uh, 16, 12 in Houston and four in the Bay Area. So when, does, when, does, when do you start hitting stride where you're opening up uh, a lot more stores and you hit before you go public? How many stores you have before you go public? Well, we started uh, recognizing that this was going to be a potential public company uh, in 86. We started opening beyond Northern California and uh, uh, the Gulf Coast in, in Houston. We started opening in Portland, Oregon, Sacramento, California, Seattle, California. And we recognized that it was working uh, not just equally well in different cities, but that as we uh, uh, grew beyond our um, uh, our early television personality, that was not me. I began in 86. Uh, the image of the business changed and our average store volume in Sacramento, Portland and Seattle was higher than our average volume in Houston or the Bay Area. And so we realized that not only was this going to work everywhere, but it was going to work even better. And so uh, I guess in 92, we went public on the NASDAQ, not very exciting, uh, $13 a share, uh, a market cap 
of a hundred million dollars for the entire hundred percent of the company. And uh, uh, we raised, uh, I think seven million for the company and seven million for the se selling shareholders. And that hundred million dollar uh, market cap in 92 grew to two billion dollars by uh, 2012. How much did you own when you first went public of the hundred million? What was your stake? I owned a third. And uh, did you go to sleep that night saying, I, did you go to sleep like, wow, I started this in Houston? I did. It, it's crazy, right? Yeah. No, it, it, this is how I have explained this exact point. I say to people, didn't your mom tell you that money doesn't grow on trees? That's true, unless you're the founder of a public company. Yeah. Because money is growing on trees. And whenever, you know, I stopped paying myself uh, materially when we went public in 92. So I have not had a paycheck in close to 30 years. And what I did was live off the sale of men's warehouse stock. So by the time I was fired, I only owned 4% of the company. So wait, so wait. Which was why they fired me. When you were held, when you held the shares, you had 30% of the company when you went public. Yes. Right? So every time, instead of taking a salary, which was due you, you took a salary of let's say a dollar or whatever, and anytime you needed money, you sold shares, you diluted yourself? Correct. All right. And I did not issue myself ever an option. And people used to say to me, I'm talking about my closest friends, why, why don't you issue options? And uh, part of what made Men's Warehouse unique was that people understood that I was trying to be an authentic human being and that I would not therefore try to amass for myself the most money, that I would try to amass for the group the most money, but not, and I, yes, I would get the most in the group because I own the most stock, but it was done on everybody having appreciated value and, and not just paying salaries and bonuses. Okay, so as time goes on, the business is successful, the companies are earning money, uh, each year you're doing well, uh, you're, 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 everything's going great. Really? Everything's going great. You open up, when do you open up in New York on 46th street? Uh, that's the latest store, right? I, I don't think that was our last market. You know, even though I'm from New York, I opened every place in America until New York city. I think it was in the nineties yeah. after we went public. You know, I do remember going there and I'll tell you why, cause we had an office there until 96. So when, uh, dress down Fridays or whatever it was called when you, uh, cause we used to wear a suit casual every day, Fridays. casual Fridays. That's right. Uh, I needed to buy, I couldn't wear a suit on Friday. My wife yelled at me. So I had, I went to your store and I bought three pair of pants and two sweaters or three sweaters. And that was it. And that had to be 94 or five, somewhere around there. Cause we moved out in 96. Uh, Cause I didn't know where to go, honestly. I didn't know, I didn't know where to, to shop. I could have went to Century 21, but I had to take the train and they didn't, and they didn't alter. You altered. I figured what a great deal. <laughs> you know, and it's walking distance to my office. Well, we charge you for the alterations. Uh, yeah, but it didn't matter. It was, it was, what's up? We charged for alterations. One of the uh, magical things about men's warehouse is from the get go, we charged for alterations. We never gave alterations for free. No, I, I don't and care. I used to say to the company, not just the tailors, 
when the tailors are working for free, we'll give free alterations. No, I had no problem with paying. It was just that everything was self-contained. You bought the pants, you walked over to the tailor, he did them right there, you came back, I don't know, four days or three days later, it was a simple operation. So even if you had to pay eight or $10, I didn't have to go make another stop. I was there already. And, and the tailor, when he would look at it and he'd go, uh, you know, you had good tailors, you had honest tailors, they would go, no, this is too here. Let me not only take the semen, I'll take it in the crotch, let me take a little here. They make the pants look good on you or the suit, whatever it might be. That's a big value yes. add. No, they were excellent tailors at that store. I mean, it was a huge tailor shop where we probably had eight or ten tailors working there. That was great. I remember, I, you know, look, I went there a couple of times because, you know, me, men, mostly men, I, you don't buy that many clothes, you know. So uh, I told my wife there, I got three pants and two sweaters. I'm done. She goes, done? <laughs> go, I'm done for the next year and a half. I'm good. Every time I went to New York, I went to that store and it was the highest rent in the company. We paid $1.2 million a year rent for that location. It was worth every which, nickel, worth every nickel, George. When I signed that lease, <laughs> I remember thinking, well, we started at $3,500 a month. Yeah, but you're, you're at 1.2 million. Yeah, but you know, with people outside who are listening to this podcast, when back in the day before COVID, when you were in New York, especially where you were at 46 and Mad, right, Madison? Yes. Yeah. Just one office building has more people than most little towns in America. So you have all these people buying suits, all these people working, all these buying clothes. It was just a different time. It was crowded. The streets were crowded between 12 and 1 o'clock. You know, you yeah, couldn't walk no, away. Yeah, you know, I was in New York uh, two weeks ago, and uh, I thought it was it, it was just before Omicron. And I went up to uh, Rockefeller Center and, you know, walked around to Radio City, and I thought it was starting to come back. Omicron just yeah, yeah. put an end to that. But you know, you had a lot, because my, my son now works at uh, 30 Rock, and... Uh, a lot of tourists there. Now, New Yorkers, you know, are still, uh, you know, with the um, work at home. So you got a lot of tourists. It looks like a lot of people. But as you go to the spots down on, uh, uh, I don't even know where the spots are anymore, you know, Empire State Building. And the business areas, it's still like Midtown. Midtown, you see so many empty stores, restaurants. It's just sad. Yeah. It's just sad. Times Square, it's really sad. You know? I, what do you think they're going to do for New Year's? Uh Look, I, this, this show will be after New Year's, so I hope I'm wrong in this, but uh, it looks like the, 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 with de Blasio and, it, and, and, the, and the progressives in New York, they'll probably close it down or, or alter it greatly to uh, unintended. There are really <laughs> fewer people. But uh, look, we have to wear masks on the subway, and they're coming back with a whole bunch of uh, mandates. So uh, it's, it's not fun. It's not fun. You still live in Brooklyn? I still live in Brooklyn. Still live in Brooklyn. Yes, sir. Born and bred. Um, all right. So now business is going well. I didn't know that you started to dilute your shares. Now the story changes. Now, one thing I noticed what you'd started doing is maybe because you're just a pure soul. I don't know what or just a nice guy. I don't know what it is. As I'm reading this book, I'm cringing because you're putting people on the board of directors without experience in menswear, without experience in business. Even you start to put people on the board which uh that you i don't know how can i say uh, who who caught your fancy at one point or you liked for a whole bunch of other reasons is that an accurate statement george yes it is okay so the board is serving at the pleasure of the ceo which is representing shareholder uh, interests and I'm, I'm, I don't want to make Monday morning quarterback because it's so unfair. But just imagine if you had a board of fellow businessmen, of some big box retailers, of some manufacturers, some of power guys, they would have known in a heartbeat that you're the reason the business is what it is. But when you hire guys who never signed the front of a check for a business or never took a $3,500 rent, uh, you know, and, and had to make a go out of it, what do you expect them to do? Well, uh, 
I'm sorry if I'm being tough on you, George. I, I'm, I don't want to be tough on you because I, 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 it hurts. You know, I, I, I feel the pain that you, that came between the sentences here. It said you built a business, you gave it everything, you put in a hundred hours a week, you sacrificed so much, you cared so much about everyone in your chain, from the top guy down to the guy who, who tailored my pants, and you got kicked in the ass. Well. The company did go chapter 11 uh, five years after they got rid of me. So there is some solace. Uh. And uh, the stock went up after they got rid of me. And I actually uh, started my new company, Generation Tux, with the increase in value in my men's warehouse stock. Oh, good for uh, you. <laughs> yes. Now that was a, uh, a a false hype that they spun about the uh, Joe Bank acquisition that drove the stock up, but uh, uh, what the hell? It it still financed my newest venture, which is booming. Okay, before we talk about that, because I do want to talk about that, I wanted you to explain to me how tuxedos are doing well in this environment, because I just can't figure that one out. But you're going to share with that. You're going to share that with me. But let's go back a second. So now we're at the 2010, a little earlier than that. You're still, uh, I think you're, you're not as involved with the company on a day to day. Is that right? More or less towards the end? I guess that's right. I mean, I had, uh, turned over the CEO ranks to a uh, guy who ultimately, uh, succeeded me, uh, when they got rid of me, um, I hired him as our tie buyer in the mid nineties. And so, uh, although he was uh, trained at Macy's, uh, you know, he was not me. Okay. And, uh, okay. Obvious. That's, that goes without saying, right? So, you know, when the company loses the founder, so you're backing away from the business, you hire a guy to replace you more or less. And you're, you have a, a, a board of directors, of a bunch of guys who were your friends, right? They were your friends, most of them. Uh, you know, yes, uh, they were. Uh, I want to tell you a story about Deepak Chopra. I was just going to bring him up. I was just going to bring him up. Like, why is he on your board? Well, he's on my board because I always respected his judgment, not about business, because he really wasn't in business prior to joining my board. But let me share this story. Uh, we, I'm, I'm going back, I don't even remember, 10 or 20 years, and my CFO is talking to me about a quarterly uh, release that we're going to make the next day. And he says to me, George, we made 10 cents a share. And I said to him, you mean that's what we actually made? He said, yes. Do you want to release that? Yes. So the next day, so we're driving in the car, and my CFO tells me he made a mistake. We only made nine cents, not 10 cents. And did I want to issue a correction? I asked him to call the board of directors together that day. And when I posed the question on the call to the board of directors, Deepak Chopra, who was relatively new to the board, said, is that a serious question? And I said, yes, Deepak, it's a serious question. And he said, you must issue a correction regardless of what Wall Street thinks about the ineptitude that that demonstrates. And we issued a correction and there was no negative downside pull. And it was uh, one of those moments where I thought to myself, that's why I put Deepak on our board. Now, having said that, he was part of the unanimous decision 
to get rid of me. Okay. So I got you. Oh, look, that's nice. That's nice. If it, if that, but you know what? You know what I'm saying? It's nice, but you would have done the right thing. I, I can't see you now. You're an authentic guy to begin with. It's your face there. It's your company. Even if you didn't take the board vote, I, something tells me you would have with the retraction because the, the repercussions to your reputation is just too great for that, for that missing that. So if you want to give him credit because you're a nice fella, well, let's give him the credit. But here's, my, here's, my, here's what I'm just trying to grapple with. Yes. You, 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 you built this business with your idea, with your moxie, with your grit. You suffered through a lot. You kept diluting your shares, which I don't, I don't know why nobody was telling you, don't do that. Uh, and secondly, pay yourself a salary. Okay, maybe your advisors weren't thinking. Put that all aside. You fill the board with a lot of people that don't have the connections that you have. You were still the business, right? It was still your, your Rolodex. Uh, you know, we know how the business works, especially the sportswear business and, and the gone business. It's all connections. It's not dealing with balance sheets. They're dealing with people. Right? You had suppliers for probably years. Well, I had the uh, connections with manufacturers and in, in uh, television advertising. So, Which, yes. Without that, what, you don't have a business. That's right. <laughs> That's, That's your business, right. right? Okay. So you, you are the business. You are the business. Right. Now you stack the board with a whole bunch of guys here that are your friends, your golfing buddies, whatever it might be, and they give you this little, you know, fortune cookie yeah tidbits of wisdom. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm just playing along with you. Okay. Hey, call it the way it is. Okay, I, I'm, no, I'm looking at this. I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm reading this book and you can ask my wife. I was reading on a Friday and I go, I can't, and I'm reading, I go, I can't believe this. She goes, what's up? I go, I can't believe he's doing this. I can't believe he's doing this. And like, I knew the guys you're setting up, these guys are going to stab you in the back. Not because I don't think they're bad people. I just think they're very easily influenced because they don't know business. They don't know your business. So if you told me you had all the connections to the vendors and you were the face of the company, I could hire anybody to replace any other position but those two. Or even the TV uh, stuff we could. You, you're Charles, sourcing, your sourcing is tremendous. Let me tell you, you're not going to like this answer. But it's an honest answer to that question. So I went out of my way to assemble that board of directors, not because I was friends, but because they agreed with me about stakeholder versus shareholder capitalism. Now, what the mistake I made was that they didn't really agree with me about that. They just were kissing my butt. So I would think they agreed because obviously when push came to shove, they chose a shareholder capitalist, not a stakeholder right, capitalist. Right, right. Okay, let me speed up the story because I can speak to you for hours, but I want to get to the, to, the, to the good part or the sad part. I shouldn't say the good part, the sad part. So, so it's beautiful. You have, a, you, have a, you have a beautiful smile and you're so happy sitting there. So I'm looking at the book and you look like the same guy here. So, you know, no difference is not wearing a tuxedo, but okay. So, so here's, here's where I'm at. So yes. you, you, you have this board and as time goes on, uh, and by the way, you misread them totally. You were like, you were like walked into a, into a lion's den. You had no, that goes to show how clueless you are as to the way they would act or react yes. to what you had. Okay. So at the end of the day, it all comes down to the money. And it seems to be that they were sold a bill of goods that doing this deal with Joseph A. Banks, which made no sense. I remember when they did it, the thing, I, I just said, tell me how this, where did this ever make sense taking on so much debt and taking a company which more or less you have the same customers. I looked at Joseph A. Banks. There was one in New Jersey in the Monmouth Mall. I walked in there, you know, three suits for, I don't know, some ridiculous number, two, three hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, yes. I don't know. And I said, with Men's Warehouse, they're going to be cannibalizing themselves. And you're taking on debt. So I, I, yeah. I just didn't get it. I didn't get that deal. Well, that may have been part of the reason they got rid of me. Because uh, they knew I was uh, very familiar with Joe Bank. And uh, that I would not have... Uh, uh, not only would I have not bought them for $1.8 billion, Ridiculous. 
I wouldn't have bought them for $1 because we had about 80% overlap in customers. 80%? Yeah, and it was documented on film. And my successor knew that and just, uh, I guess that's called an unconscious bias when they want to do something and they forget about uh, the information. Well, it's basically, he shot the arrow, then painted the bullseye. You know, I'm getting this acquisition regardless of what it costs or how stupid it make, it, it becomes. But, but the lawsuit fizzled. They never got sued. Hmm. Okay, so you now, showdown, you walk into a, it was a hotel, what was it? I remember you described the room in the book. It's a pretty, uh, with a, with a fire. Oh, no, it was a hotel. Yeah, hotel. Got fire. yeah. Hotel. I remember the scene. I'm saying, oh, this is where the guy has to meet his end. What a place. So you I walk know. in there. It was a nice place. What's that? It was a nice place. It yeah, was sure. okay. Okay, it was okay. You go around and they all vote you out. They say, you know, thanks. And they give you, I think, what, a small window of time, a few hours to make a decision. You step us yes. through that. Well, tell me about that again. Well, actually, what happened was that I walk in uh, Monday at five o'clock in the afternoon and we have a, a public company shareholder meeting Wednesday morning. And so this is sort of a uh, prep meeting for the board before uh, we, we do that. And they tell me that... Uh, they want me to step down as a uh, chairman of the board the, at the time they don't say I'm done with the company. They just say they want me to step down as chairman of the board and they want to uh, actually send out new proxy statements, even though it's a fait accompli and, and they want to have a new uh, shareholder meeting where I'm no longer the chairman. Was this legal? So, Was this legal, George? It is legal. And uh, they gave me a few hours to uh, uh, resign. And at 10 p.m. that night, I called uh, the uh, a lawyer for the board and who was a good friend of mine and said, you know, Mike, I'm not resigning. And he uh, passed the message on. And the next uh, morning at nine or 10 o'clock, uh, the lead director who was six foot seven and stood up at the table. So he really towered over everybody. And I think he understood the uh, uh, raison d'etre for doing that. And he, he said to me, George, by unanimous consent, the board of directors has decided to not only terminate you as chairman of the board, but to terminate you from all uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, involvement with the company. And this was the thing, I wrote it in the book, and probably I'm the only one that remembers this, is he then said, and we've put your furniture and knickknacks in, in storage. And I remember thinking, you did that already? Well, then you you must have been planning this. And it was, I'd only been there from day one. So when you think about the, the knickknacks that I had acquired, it was startling. And, and I did have a devoted assistant who started working for me when she was 16 and is now in her 50s. And she uh, she was able to uh, uh, get the 50 cartons of stuff that they put in storage and bring it to my home uh, uh, when I finally uh, settled down. But, you know, this story has a happy ending, Charles, because not only has my new company, which was funded by the growth in men's warehouse stock, not only is it booming 
And I know you wanted to uh, ask why uh, with COVID. Well, well tell, with, tell, tell us what the business is, because I didn't let you do that. Well, it's it's the suit and tuxedo rental for weddings. And after a very difficult 2020, uh, our business this year went up by over 100 percent. And we started making a lot of money. It, it, it's it's hard for anybody who's uh, not doing what I'm doing to understand what this means. But we have a business that makes 80 percent gross profit percentage. So that's quite extraordinary in the apparel business. And it, it makes the company very lucrative. And although I'm not sure I want to take it public, having had the uh, experience I had, uh, I do think it's quite valuable. Well, if you take it public, George, ask someone, one of, you, one of your enemies or something, pick who would you want on the board? Anyone they say, don't use. <laughs> well, I'll probably ask you, Charles. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. So l- let me ask you this. Uh, your, yes. this, this business is an online business or physical presence? Online only. Okay. So you're, you're buying, you're using this, your, your contacts of 50, 60 plus years, you're getting tremendous, uh, um, I, I assume that, I, I'm not, I don't know who your you know, suppliers are. That's correct. Okay. So you're using people who still know George Zimmer is George Zimmer. There's no question. That's, that's, right. that's what people don't get, you know, especially these people who fired you in this. Because they never had it. That's the thing. They never had it because it's you. They, they don't get also that it's you who was the business. It wasn't Men's Warehouse. It was George Sim- Zimmer, Inc. It was, it was you of the business. And once you leave the business, there's no more Men's Warehouse. That's right. You know, it, it, it's, it's a lot of hubris that people think it's all them that built something. When you have the founder who built it and, you look, know, your, your little black book of, of, of contacts from 50 years if you called me up in the middle of the night right after you left, you say, Charles, I'm looking for investors. I'm investing in, stop right there, George. Where do I send my check? You have the contacts. You have the experience. You have all the mistakes paid for in your first business. You got to do well. You know, it's, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, I actually uh, spoke to, uh, you probably know him, David Rubenstein, who uh, offered me $3 billion dollars to buy my company back. And here's what I told them. Hmm. I said, Mr. Rubenstein, that is very generous of you to make that offer. But at my age, I don't want to borrow $3 billion to buy back a company I started for seven grand. Love it, love it. And he said, I understand. No, it's great. You don't want to work for another guy. It's he, basically you're working for him, you know. Yeah, that's it. Right. So tell me this business model. I'm just I'm not grasping it. You online, you buy suits and tuxedos, right? Oh, it's unbelievable. Tell me, I want to hear it. Now I developed this, Charles, at Men's Warehouse uh, in the '90s, and then it became. I, today, it's probably the main part of what Men's Warehouse does. But uh, so, so they're actually a, uh, a real competitor because they're much larger. But we buy uh, a product and then we rent it for between 20 and 30 times. So when you look at the cost of sales, the number one uh, cost of sale is freight. Number two is cleaning because we clean every garment, including the shoes. And number three is the cost of the product because when you rent it 20 or 30 times, the cost of the product is somewhat de minimis. So the result of this is that we have generated a business that is on its way to doing a hundred million dollars and earning EBITDA of $50 million. Have you ever 
heard of a business like that. I think Apple. Other than jewelry. No, 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 in, in, in apparel, it's unheard of. But what's the magic yeah. here? What's the magic here? Because uh, we used to have so many, uh, I remember in, in Brooklyn, there used to be Zeller's tuxedos, you know, the same business model. Sure. They had the a physical magic plan. is we make the tuxedo. Well, first of all, when you're in an online rental business, you establish a base inventory and then you augment it just very incrementally as you go uh, season to season or year to year. And uh, I'm going to be uh, recruiting and hiring my kid brother to uh, work part time for us because what he used to love and uh, only I remember this was he used to love looking at computer printouts of size and on hell on hand sales at men's warehouse. You know, there were 50 sizes and uh, it was something that he, he, he became quite adept at. And I think he's going to be very excited about doing this for us. And it's not just suits and tuxedos. We do shirts, we do vests, we do shoes, uh, et cetera, neckwear. So <laughs> this has turned into, well, uh, it, 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 it literally is like a Nevada gold or silver mine only in the apparel business. Beautiful, beautiful. So, so uh, you, you, you have costs for, per acquisition of each customer, right? Because you're sending them from in the internet, right? Or All social media. Okay, so, you, so you're not spending anything on Google Networks or you're not spending anything in that? You're just basically... Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, Google. Okay, you know, so digital marketing, so you bring digital marketing, yeah. that's your oh, old advertising. Marketing. Okay, you're bringing, them, you're bringing it to the site. What is the cost of a tuxedo, you know, rental? Uh, give me an give me average unit cost. Like if I wanted to rent a tuxedo, what's it costing me? Well, you were getting into a, a detail here, Charles. I mean, it's 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 about a buck and a quarter. Okay, so there, now here's my question, George. There was because I see my boys. I have four boys from 31 to 21. They don't wear suits. They don't wear. You know, in fact, it's funny because one of my we're going to a family wedding soon. At first, in a long while, and my son said, "I have to buy a suit." I swear to you, it was the other day. I said, "You know, I don't even know where to get a suit from." You know, all the stores are closed down. We used to go to Century 21. They're closed. You're closed. Where do you get suits from? And, uh, but it's, that's one suit. So if he's going to buy a suit for $300, say, for one and a quarter, he could rent it from you, right? Get the suit rented. And you do all alterations. And how does that work uh, with the alterations? How do you do it online? Well, we've come up with a uh, propri proprietary uh, way in which you can do all of it online in about uh, one minute. So, uh, uh, see that that, it, that that to me is the magic sauce because if you yeah. have mistakes in the alterations, that's going to cost you a fortune back and forth. Well, you know, when we started Generation Talks, we actually sent a tape measure to our customers and said, you know, you need to measure certain things. And uh, of course, what we found out was that uh, people do not know how to measure with any consistency. So right. we had to come up with another way. And we have a, a, a proprietary way now that we think is, is quite impressive. So you're seeing that if I order a tuxedo online or a suit online, the turnaround uh, for me having, say, say, say you send it to me and my, the wedding's on Sunday what, and I get it Thursday. Do you pay for alterations for me if, if, uh, if I need them done or, uh, um, you know, I, I just got the suit from you. What am I going to do? You're not allowed to take it out for your own alterations. We have tailors in Louisville where this is all headquartered and uh, they do the alterations. Uh, you're not allowed, uh, nor is it recommended that you do your own. But how do, so I, there's, how do I have the turnaround? If I have to go to the wedding, the wedding is- uh, We send it to you in a box. 
two weeks before the event. Uh, got it. And then after the event, you send it back in the same box. We pay freight both ways. How, how, how much, how long after the event do I have to send it back to you? Within three days. So you're taking a suit out of inventory 17 days and turning it 30 times, 20 to 30 times? Correct. See, you got to be making money. <laughs> that's, that's, that's an enormous turn. You understand, Charles, that you and I are the only two people <laughs> on this call that understand what we're talking about. I don't know. We might have a couple of other garment center people back in the day, but if, if that's it, wow! You you got you got another gold mine. You got another gold mine. That's great. Generation generation tux. Tux. Yes. Tux. All right. Beautiful. One word. No capitals. Okay. So generation tux. T U. Spell the list. How do you spell tux? T U X. T U X dot com. Correct. Okay. So anyone listening, you need a suit tie. A whole ensemble to go anywhere and you don't want to spend money because you don't want their men's warehouse you don't want to go there anymore because you love george zimmer order it on generationtux.com and the fit got to be perfect right so during those two weeks i could send it back to you and say the the pants were hemmed wrong or something correct that's why we send it two weeks early so that you have that opportunity if if it's uh, required Wow, I guess cleaning bill's probably your biggest, uh, well, shipping, right? Shipping and cleaning would probably be your two biggest. Uh, That's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to start, George. Don't, you, I, 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 you could totally trust I will not get into this business. <laughs> I left the garment business years ago, and I, I could sleep better at nights, the market. Well, you know, nobody has the contacts right. that I have to get the right. product. And quite frankly, uh from what I've been told, our customers love our products. And, uh, you know, it, it's not like there's a lot of repeat business, right? Unless somebody gets divorced, there's no repeat customer here. And so uh, it, it really is about word of mouth. And I've always been the type of guy that I'm in no hurry. I figure I'm going to be doing this until I drop. And uh, I, it took me a number of years to get this to where it worked well. And now it's uh, even better than men's warehouse. As I like to say, it's nice to be in the uh, suit and tuxedo rental business without being encumbered by 1,200 men's stores. No, yeah, no, it's a, you have no rent. It's it's your biggest, you, you, you have a distribution center. So right. know, the, the internet is your rent. There you go. You know, beautiful. I, if you give me that, I guarantee it, George. I got to hear that from you. Well, I'll make more money on Gen Tux than I made on Men's Warehouse. I guarantee it. I love it. And you got to come back here when, when it comes, when it goes public. This is amazing. This really is. George, one last thing for you that I was thinking when I was yes, reading the book. Sure. If there's one thing, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, you know, I, I I usually go a little shorter, but I, I could speak to you, Farris. By the way, if you're ever in New York, uh, definitely call me. Uh, dinner is on me. I'd love to sit and talk to you for hours. I really, you wouldn't have to talk. Yeah. You, you could eat. You could just listen to me if you want. So I'll make sure it'll be worth like it. I time. said I was there two weeks ago. So I didn't, I didn't know you then, so I'll wait for the next <laughs> I was just going to say the next time with now this whole mandate's coming down, I, I, I don't know what's going on with that. But if you look back, and I want you to think about this for a second. Yes. If you can look back on everything from the day you opened those stores, that your first store in Houston to now, to, to right before you started Gen, Generation Talks, if you had to do one thing, and I know you're not the type of guy because I've just seen your demeanor and, your, and, your, and the way your outlook is on life. You look forward, not back. But if you could have done one thing, that would have made a big difference. And I forget about where you would have ended up, but just knowing what happened, what would it have been? What is one thing you would have done differently? Um, you know, there's not much that uh, I wish I had done differently in my life. 
And I don't mean that uh, uh, as arrogant as it may sound, but uh, here's something that I, I would do differently. When my grandmother died in the late 80s, I was doing men's warehouse Christmas parties and didn't go to her funeral. And I wish I had gone to her, her funeral. That That's was a mistake. That still bothers you, huh? Well, it doesn't bother me, but you asked me what I yeah. would do differently. And that's it. And yeah. In terms of the business, the, the shareholder, the, nothing, you wouldn't have done anything different with that. Hey, you know, I hired my friends and they stabbed me in the back. So I don't know that but, but your comment is yeah. accurate. I about my board but if i had if i had the board sitting here instead of you and i ask you know give me the lowdown on this zimmer guy tell me what the other side of the story is what can they possibly say you want the joseph a banks well, well, well it doesn't make any sense <laughs> that, 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 i was going before that what they would say was george was a very arrogant man and very difficult to work with that's what they would say George built 1,200 stores from scratch. We can, you can be president of my fan club, Charles, but they right. were not. Wow, they were, they, were fan, they, were, they weren't fans. They weren't part of it. They were part of the, how do we hang George publicly? <laughs> well, they do day. I mean, you know, it happens. Wow, wow. I really, I, I, you know, I could learn from you in having the optimistic, let bygones be bygones and move forward attitude. I really... You know, I still remember the kid in second grade who stole my eraser and never gave it back to me. So I got a lot of, I got, I got a lot of baggage. Charles, I remember all that. I, I just don't like to talk about it. Yeah, that's that's best for you. That's best for you. But this sounds exciting. And and George, I, I, I wish you the, I don't have to wish you the best of luck. You're going to do amazingly well because you're the business. You, it's your reputation. It's George Zimmer. And you know, how does that make you feel when when when? The Carlisle Group says, we'll give you $3 billion. Forget about not taking it. That must have made you feel amazing, huh? That's more than it the did. market cap. That's, that's almost double the market. Well, not double, but one and a half times the market cap of men's warehouse at its, at its best. He's willing to throw at you. Yeah. No, it was because uh, he, had, <laughs> David had said to me, what is it going to take wow. to buy your company back? The company was never worth three. It was worth two. And I said three, because that's what it would take to buy it back. And uh, he said, okay. <laughs> you know, it, it's a blessing. It's a, it's a blessing. You had COVID, which would have been really tough for the menswear business. And yeah. you, you, came up with a new, you came up with a new business model uh, applying that, kid, that you could scale without much money, you know? Uh, so it, 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 it's, it, and, and you know, who you are is just going to take it to the next level. That's, that's great. All right, folks, the name of the book is, I guarantee it, the untold story behind the founder of Men's Warehouse. And now it's not so much of a untold story because George laid it all out for you there. Warts and all, you hear his shortcomings. Uh, and, and, and the fact is, he just keeps moving on. And it, the name hey, of- Charles. Yes. Go to my website. I read chapter five entitled, I guarantee it. I read that. Uh, on my website. Oh, nice. I'm, I'm going to go to the website. I want to see, I, I'd love to see, you know, we have a wedding coming up. I'd love to try it. I'd love to see it in Texas. It's great. called George Zimmer Book. George Zimmer Book. Okay, great. George, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate all the success. God should continue to bless you with a long and healthy life and keep doing great things. Thank you very much, Charles. All right, George. Thanks so much. Okay, so long. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on The Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.